When I grow up, I want to work for a woke company. Like, super woke. When I grow up, when I grow up, I want to be hired based on what I look like rather than my skills. I want to be judged by my political beliefs. I want to get promoted based on my chromosomes. When I grow up, I want to be offended by my coworkers and walk around the office on eggshells and have my words policed by HR. Words like grandfather, peanut gallery, long time no see, no can do. When I grow up, I want to be obsessed with emotional safety and do workplace sensitivity training all day long. When I grow up, I want to climb the corporate ladder just by following the crowd. I want to be a conformist. I want to weaponize my pronouns. What are pronouns? It's time to grow up and get back to work. Introducing the number one woke-free job board in America, redballoon.work. Hey all, welcome to Cross Politic. Where we, we are, are not panicking. <laughs> Pastor Toby, we are not panicking. Chuck Knox, I'm the water boy. And of course, we got David Bronson coming on. To talk about somebody's panicking. You know. Are you having a baby over there? What is going on? <laughs> I <don't> Breathe. <laughs> Give me five hard breaths. Um, and uh, we're going to talk about um, why the presidents are at fault for our economy right now. This, why? why uh, what, what was the tweet? It was like Trump uh, equals cash and Kamala. Uh, Trump cash. Kamala crash. Yeah, that's right. what uh, there we Donald go. Trump. Oh, pulled there up. we go. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm, I'm sure David agrees with that. But first, <laughs> is your smartphone a tool in the service of Christ or a minefield of distractions and temptations? With soul killing seductions just a few taps away, our families and churches must embrace biblical accountability on our digital devices. Accountable to you makes transparency easy on all your family's devices by sharing app usage and detailed browsing history, including incognito mode, with your spouse, parent, or chosen account. Accountability partner. Accountable to you helps your family to proactively guard against temptation so you can live with integrity for God's glory. Learn more and try it for free at accountable to you. That's the word accountable, the number two, the word you.com slash F L F. Grateful to have with us David Bonson. Mm-hmm. Uh, David Bonson is a great friend of the show. He breathes the market. He's a managing partner and founder of the Bonson Group and has authored, of course, the excellent new book, Full Time. David, thanks for coming on Cross Politic. Well, thank you very much, Toby. I think uh, Full Time has become an autobiography. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. That's hilarious. So, um, it, the way I, last night I was looking on my Twitter feed and saw this is where all the truth happens. It was on Twitter these days. Yeah. You, can't, you know, um, and I was looking on my Twitter feed and, J- and the J- Japan market, at least as last night when I saw it was dropping by something like 7%. Uh, Warren, Warren Buffett apparently sold a bunch of Apple shares on Friday. And then, you know, our economy, the Dow, I think ended about a thousand points down. And, and then of course you have Trump uh, using this as a, as a baton against Kamala and uh, Joe Biden. It's, it's just Kamala now. Who cares about Joe Biden anymore? <laughs> uh, but I want I want to uh, David. Before we kind of, I want I want you to get your reaction to a couple um, slides that we have here. First, we have Kamala talking about the Biden Biden Bidenomics. All that, ladies and gentlemen, and everyone else, that is called Bidenomics. <laughs> That is called Bidenomics, and we are very proud of Bidenomics. Uh, basically, that, that slide was Ka- Ka- Kamala talking about, like, oh, we're so proud of Biden economics and all that stuff. The next slide is, I mean, this is trending on Twitter right now. Kamala crash. Trump tweeted, you know, what we said earlier. Trump cash. Tam- Kamala trash. Uh, crash. Excuse me. <laughs> trash. You're making up your own thing. I can't. So. I know. I know. And and then Donald Trump comes out with, with his tweet just about blaming this all on Kamala. Right. Now, uh, David... Um, I've seen clips from you before where you kind of talk about like, you know, the presidents have very little, you know, control over the economy um, or, or we give them too much credit for it, at least um, politically. What is going on with the economy? I want to get into like the economics of what's going on, but politically what's happening here. OK, well, I appreciate the way you asked it, because it, there is a political ramification that I'm totally sensitive to. Um, I think that President Trump's tweets today were pretty ridiculous as a matter of fact and totally understandable as a matter of politics. (laughs) Everybody would do it. 
when the markets are going down and you're in a presidential race, you want to blame the party you're running against. And if markets are going up and you're the party in power, you want to take credit for it. But first of all, we do need to discuss the difference between the market and the economy and where those are, are, are different in both reality and in the political realm right now. But I just want to be clear that I am perfectly aware as a person who has committed himself to truth telling in public, mm -hmm. I'm not uh, uh, unaware of the fact that it is politically understandable to go stick this stuff on the uh, opponent. It right. is what everybody would do. And so I don't have anything negative to say about it as a political tactic. Yeah. So when I get asked if it's true, the market's down because of Kamala and, and I laugh about it, yeah. it's because I'm giving a truthful answer, not a political answer. Right. So now, is there is there a is there truth to I guess just maybe zoom out slightly and say so just Trumpian economics and Bidenomics or whatever like w would you give that any credit? Well, do I believe that tax cuts and deregulation are better than tax increases? And regulation. Do I believe energy independence is better than um, trying to hurt the U.S. energy industry? On those different counts right there, yes, I do. Now, let's be very clear. All I just did is describe Reaganomics, <laughs> which it seems that a whole lot of Trump MAGA people are unsatisfied with. Mm -hmm. But the most um, infectious positively infectious, beneficial aspects of a Trump economic agenda, which I thought he defended pretty well in his uh, convention speech, mm -hmm. um, th those things are far superior for the economy. Um, it's not the same thing uh, as lowering tax rates from 70 to 28, but you know, moving lower federal marginal rates, uh, uh, the corporate income rate, the repatriation of foreign profits, those things took place in Trump's prior term, and I think they were very advantageous. And so, yes, I would be positive there. But I don't think you anyone could point to a clear economic philosophy for President Trump. I think he's a bit more pragmatic. He, I happen yeah. to know a lot of people that are very senior advisors to him, and and he, he kind of goes off his gut, and one day he seems to like something you're saying, and the next day he doesn't. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's harder to gauge it intellectually. It's a, it's a bit more um, kind of a sport for him. And so that, that's harder for me to analyze. That's, that's, is this, he said, seven, he said 70% down to 28%. Mm -hmm. Did you hear that? Mm -hmm. 70 percent wait wait 70 yeah. percent what the, the top marginal rate for tax. reagan was 70 oh, yeah. brought it to 28 yeah, yeah. those are for reagan factual not trump. yeah but i was just yeah. saying like we lived in a, a country yeah. that was taxing people at 70 oh, percent yeah. well toby it was 90 under eisenhower yeah. the top rate <laughs> yep. was 90 yeah stop it yeah, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> is is this like republican stimulus and democratic stimulus kind of coming to roost in in our uh in this you know i don't know what would you describe this a a, a big market crash or a medium market crash what how would you describe that um no it's pretty medium by historical standards i mean the nasdaq is down from its high of about uh three or four weeks ago 13 percent. the s&p is down eight and a half it's not even a correction yet for the market. Yeah. Um, a, mar a correction is considered 10%. A bear market is considered 20%. Um, so it's, it's, look, there's three different things going on. And this is why today's market action is so obviously apolitical. You said it at the top of the show, Gabe, that Nikkei was down 12.5% yesterday. Uh -huh. So as I'm watching futures Sunday night, as I'm prone to do, and we're looking at the beginning of the opening of Asian markets, you start to think, okay, well, U.S. markets were hit Thursday, Friday. Tech had a big sell-off. Microsoft had disappointing results. NVIDIA was this overpriced dog that was finally selling off a little. And maybe the Nikkei was just catching up with what had happened. There was a little hangover from U.S. markets Thursday, Friday. Okay. Um, I'm pretty sure Japan wasn't down 12.5% in one day, the worst day since Black Monday, 1987. Uh -huh because of Kamala Harris. I don't know why Japan would have a particular response to that. Um, because she's there's Indian? a thing called the know. yen carry trade, where the yen is a very, very cheap currency to borrow. 
And uh, obviously, a ton of leverage had been built up of people, mostly Asian investors, borrowing in yen and, and reinvesting there. And the yen rallied huge against the dollar last week. So the yen had been dropping. It rallied significantly over the last five days. That trade unwinds and it just pummeled Asian markets that carried through into U.S. markets today. That's factor number one. Mm. After I breathe to let you talk, I can come back to number two and number three. I, I want to hear number two. And three. I got my pen ready. Yeah. I'm sitting here so, ready taking notes. So number one is the kind of an international currency um, investment gambling, basically. Yeah, very, very common one, but yeah. you have investors that want to borrow in a cheap currency to buy other assets, and it works until it doesn't, and yeah. then those trades had to get unwound. What we say in our business is people were getting their faces ripped off, <laughs> and that's extremely violent. That's not, that's not 12 and a half percent. That's not funny. Mm. And, and so the um, people that were caught short the yen had to cover. The yen rallied, the dollar sold off. Nikkei got killed, and you have a, a follow-on effect. But again, before this started happening, the NASDAQ had already been correcting. So this goes to point number two, which is just the NASDAQ is flat-out overvalued. NVIDIA mm. is flat-out overvalued. Mm. Um, you know, there, there is a price to perfection for your Apple, Microsoft, Google, and the market's starting to say, wait a second, all of these companies are ordering gazillions of dollars of AI, but what are they really getting from it? What's it really going to do? I think these Google ads for AI throughout the Olympics have been an embarrassment and maybe caused people to wonder, like, do we even like this? Is this even a good thing? Um, it, I want to make a point because I said this earlier uh, on an interview I did a few hours ago. The Internet was a deeply overvalued bubble in 1999. Yeah. But you understand why people were excited about the internet. E-commerce was making our lives easier. These websites were carrying information that was previously harder to get. There, there was a lot of things happening with the web that were attractive. I don't know a lot of people that are sitting around thrilled with what's going on in AI. I, th I think that there's some opportunity there for sure, but a lot of people are questioning if it's even a positive at all. Yeah. That, and and, right. and so that then just kind of coupled with a price to perfection NASDAQ has put a lot of downward pressure. And, and let's be clear, NVIDIA is down almost 30 percent from its high and it's still trading at 60 times earnings. Wow. So it may not be done here. Oh, OK. What was number three then? And then number three is the issue of the economic viability in the U.S. So very weak jobs report on Friday. Mm. And there was a huge rally in markets from late 22 throughout uh, mid 24 because the predicted recession from Fed tightening didn't come. And now there's more people saying, well, wait a second, have we sort of kicked this recession off? But is there some economic weakening that we're starting to see? The unemployment rate for most of the post-COVID Biden administration had been only 3.5%. It's come up to 4.3%. That's not high historically, but it's a big move up. There's some uh, chinks in the armor as to some of the economic issues. And so that third issue becomes economic fundamentals in the United States. So do you think that this goes back to my um, uh Initial question when we started talking about the economics of it, um, is all the the five trillion or eight trillion dollars in stimulus is that causing problems also right now? Well, it, um, Gabe, it caused it causes problems because it was borrowed money and the money hasn't been paid back and it's not going to be paid back. <laughs> But that $5 trillion is not stimulative in the economy anymore. It's one and done. It got put out. And then um, this is what we refer to as a low velocity of money. Mm -hmm. The money turning over, it stops. Be when there's this high of a debt rate, you know, the money gets spent. And they made the people who got spent with might spend it. But at some point, it gets <laughs> extinguished. And, yeah. and that's what happens with low economic confidence. And so that's all. This was a huge part of what I talked about over and over again uh, with Pastor Wilson and the book that we put out together just from our own correspondence called Misinflation, which is turning out to be one of the most pressing things Canon Press has ever put out. <laughs> um, the ex inflation expectations right now are 1.9%. 
for the next five years in the tips market. Trillions of dollars have now come all the way down to 1.9% inflation expectations. That's not a good thing. Yeah. That is happening because growth expectations have collapsed. The bond Ooh. market now, the yields in the 10 year today hit 3.7% for 10 years. So all of these that we've gone from, oh my gosh, the economy is way too hot to now it appears to be back to expectations of low growth. That, that stimulus has been extinguished and yet the debt hasn't. The debt represents a burden for economic actors to have to deal with our kids, our grandkids for decades to come. And, so, and this is and this is where your concern for um, uh, deflation. You're more concerned long term about right, that, right? Not inflation. Long term, there's no question about it. The downward pressure on economic growth that comes over and over and over again in developed societies from overly indebted government spending. The rate of our uh, government spending has gone up 11.7%. The rate of um, our economic growth has gone up less than 6%. Yeah. You cannot grow government debt at a faster rate than you're growing That's the economy. Right. That's yeah. I'm not a big fan, Toby, of growing government, period. Right. But economically, if the economy is growing at the same rate as government spending or even better, right. then you technically can get away with it for a long time. The debt to GDP ratio during the big spending years of Bush Jr. didn't go higher. It was about 50% of debt to GDP when he took office. It was about 50 when he left office. Okay. We're now over 100%. Wow. Mm. Wow. Mm. And, th and this is why, I just I know this is one of your, your drums that you love to beat, and I, but I think it, it makes sense. But this is why um, hard work is so important. Um, this is why taking responsibility, you, you spend so much time, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, and, and your, your full-time book is about this, um, crisis of responsibility is about this. But, um, if, if, you know, given the situation we're in, he's like, what, what do we do? Yeah. Well, well, like one of the very most practical things you can do is you can actually, um, use your time in a productive way. And that is one piece of the puzzle of, um, sort of backfilling that lack of value that disinflation. Yeah. Well, that's right. And it's time, talent, and treasure. The, okay, the, 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 this cliche about these three T's, these are the resources we have. And so the abilities we have, the skills, the work, the productive labors, every good endeavor, these things are a huge resource we bring to this discussion. Our time is what we spend our time doing, how we raise our families, how we educate kids, how we do culture building activities, how we think entrepreneurially. But then our, our uh, treasure resources, which is often so bemoaned, we just make little smart aleck comments about Wall Street instead of understanding that our capital is also a tool that is needed to build the kingdom of God. And a lack of capital formation is an absolute disaster for those who value economic growth. David, can I ask a question? You, you brought up earlier, and I have it written here. I, I, we've kind of passed by it, but you talked there's a difference between the market and the economy. Could you break down the difference between yeah. those two? Yes, well, the market is fundamentally forward-looking. It's pricing in today what it believes about the future. The market is weighing earnings, mm. okay? And so in theory, there are all kinds of periods of time where uh, corporate profits are good, expectations for corporate profits can be good, and you could have weakness in the broader economy. Um, you know, Apple can sell more phones or get more pricing power, uh, get a higher multiple at NVIDIA um, at a time in which small businesses are hurting a great deal. And so there is not a perfect correlation. And even if these things converge over time, they're just nowhere near linear. And so what is happening in the market and the economy should always be thought of differently. Now, ultimately, Economic growth is where corporate profits are going to be captured, and corporate profits are what weigh into stock prices. So there is an eventual convergence, but it is just not linear, and therefore I think it's important to view these two conversations separately. And so, so it, how you see what is happening right now, would it be fair to say to the, um, the market, what is the market telling us? 
Um, I think that the market is telling us the three things I said before, that A, there was a technical issue that was significant in global financial markets with the yen. Number two, a bunch of U.S. market uh, investments are overpriced, are vulnerable, priced to perfection, and any little thing that shakes the tree could cause it to go wrong. And then number three, that there is some potential concern in terms of forward-looking um, economic strength. The the great analogy I'd use is the year 2000. And I want to make a political point about that too, by the way. Yeah. The NASDAQ ended up going down 70% after March of 2000, and it stayed down for 15 years. Wow. But it was down about 50%. Now, the economy was quite good. The budget was balanced. Mm. Unemployment was pretty low. Economic growth was over 5%. Do you think the NASDAQ dropping 50% cost Al Gore 527 votes in Florida? Mm. I do. <laughs> it was a very small factor, but the market might impact how people feel about how they're doing. And there had been such a cultural euphoria around all that tech investing and NASDAQ right. investing right. in 1998, 99, and, and into 2000. That, that bubble bursting impacted that election. Mm-hmm. And, and we just don't, people think all the time, like everybody's MAGA or everyone is a socialist. It, that's just not true. We have a 50-50 country and an election that's going to be decided on the margins. So the market has a political ramification here, mm-hmm. but I don't think that's the same as the overall economy. The overall yeah. economy is a bigger story. Right. And and it's about narratives. And that's why President mm. Trump sent tweets out today. He's trying to reinforce yeah. a narrative right. that it, they're bad for the economy and he's good for the economy. It, and hyperbole is part of the American political tradition. And so you're <laughs> and so you're arguing that what happened in two thousand, okay, the economy was good for the average Joe, but the Nasdaq dropping still like that that narrative sways people and how they might think politically and and also how they feel about the economy. Yeah, and again, when it's that tight, 527 votes in Florida, then yes, I think it it is obviously on the margin more impactful. Um, an election that's going to be set by three percent, four percent, I I don't think it's as much. Um, but overall there is a lot of correlation between mm. sentiment and and the market. And it's not always rational. It's not always healthy. But I certainly think it's a, a fair political uh, tradition. So what do you make of the market, you know, the the, the volatility index? Um, uh, Neil, you want to bring that, that um, up here where, you know, this last year um, it was pretty level. And then, of course, this last, uh, you know, basically these last couple of days, it's, it's shot way up. First of all, what is the volatility index kind of defining as volatility? What, what's the definition of market vol- volatility that, th- that this graph is trying to capture? And then what is, how does this play into your analysis? Is that the VIX that you have up yes. there? Yes, correct. See it. Yep. Yeah. So the VIX is commonly referred to as the fear index, and it's the price people are paying to buy protection on the S&P. So it's been very, very, very low for about a year, somewhere between 13 and 15. And uh, we refer to it in in our business as a very good contrarian indicator. When the VIX gets very high, it usually means a year later that things can be really good. And when the VIX gets too low, it can, it can be a problem. Now, today is just an anomaly because you just obviously had a ton of short-term traders uh, going out and buying a bunch of protection on the S and P, but it it went to um, at one it was at one point it was up 180 percent today, and it closed the day up 60 percent. So that's what it means by volatility game is it's uh, amount people are paying in the options market to buy protection mm. on the S and P. It measures their fear. Okay. The okay. more they're willing to pay to buy protection, the more fearful they are. Yeah, and so th- it it measures volatility that way, and um, it. It is not necessarily a super helpful indicator other than measuring a sentiment, uh, but you need about 30 days to really see more substantively how this plays out. Maybe Gabe understands all of that. David, but I, I'm I'm just a lowly pastor. So, um, it's, it's what, like mortgage why insurance here? or like house what, insurance what, or life. What does it mean to go out and buy protection on the S and P? So we have a very robust thing in our capital markets uh, called an options market, where 
uh, someone can enter into a contract, and these contracts trade on an exchange. They're very uh, securitized. They're packaged. They're they're uh, heavily liquid. They trade heavily, and there's all sort. There's pension funds in Indiana, and there's Norwegian sovereign wealth funds, and then there's Mr. and Mrs. Smith that want to buy options for various aspects of their portfolio, either speculating, hedging, protecting, you know, any number of things that could make sense in different economic self-interest. In the case of the VIX, you're just essentially buying a, a uh, contract um, that is pr producing a benefit. You have a price you can lock for the S&P, and if it goes below that, you're you're kind of set, but you're paying an insurance premium to uh -huh. hedge at that price. <laughs> okay. And so you can buy put options on the S&P. You can buy call options. Got it. The, the, I understand that the vocabulary you know, get, gets a little wonky here, but, but it's um, various financial instruments instruments that amount to, with the VIX, particularly um, measuring what one's, uh, the protection they want to, what they want to pay for the protection on the S&P. And, it, and it's indicating some level, though, of concern. This this market might be doing things that I don't want it to do. Um, and so it, you're buying an insurance policy, essentially, that says that if it goes to a certain point, it'll, it'll sell or it'll do something to protect my, uh, my wealth. That's correct. Okay. What do you make of um, today? Um, uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene kind of tweeted this out. She said, these brokerage firms are reporting errors for retail investors while institution investors are able to make trades. Uh, oh, that, and it's too many <laughs> platforms to be a coincidence. So she you know, includes Fidelity, Ameritrade, Lumen, Vanguard. Um, is, she, is she wrong that that happened? Or, or what do you make of that tweet? Let me give you a little help here. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. <laughs> I'm excited. <laughs> if the question starts with, is Marjorie Taylor Greene right? <laughs> the, part, the second part of the sentence does not need to be completed. <laughs> well, I, I, I did hear things like, uh, you know, and I, of course, again, not everything you read is, is true, but I heard like, you know, Robin Hood was shutting down trades for the day. You know, um, you know, I heard that servers, no. were, you know, these trading systems were having server problems, you know, that kind of that kind of stuff. And I, I didn't know uh, what to think of it. Yeah. So what what uh, Robin Hood had some issues um, with their overnight trading that they, they were not able to fill some of the 24 seven trading. Um, like, I, I don't know if you've spent a lot of time in Vegas at a casino, but there's the people that go play blackjack like at eight o'clock at night. Yeah. And then there's the people that play blackjack at four in the morning. Yeah. 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 And, and they don't look the same and, and act the same exactly. <laughs> <laughs> the people that needed Robin Hood to trade overnight are kind of the 4 a.m. Vegas person. Okay. And so it, I did read the report today that they had some issues. Um, Fidelity and Schwab are the largest platforms for institutional investors. My company manages $6 billion through the institutional wealth services, uh, about $5 billion plus changes with Fidelity and a little mm -hmm. less than a billion with Schwab. Okay. And, and so we were open for trading all day. Every trade we put on got executed. We, we traded a couple hundred million dollars mm -hmm. of assets today. Um, so it, there were a few headlines that she was doing and and tweeting out about it. Total ignorance is not true. And these are the these are the things that just, I think, are unhelpful to the yeah. national conversation. So you're doing trades today. Um, what are you telling your clients right now? Yeah, well, we're, we were when I say trades, we were we're not trading. We're deploying capital. And mm. so we have at a company of our size, we have a constant flow of new capital that's coming in. And that represented the amount of money that we were putting to work. Right? You know, new funds come in and we deploy them systematically in our process. And my, I'm the chief investment officer. I have to kind of quarterback that. And today we were putting more money to work than we would have in a normal day, largely because of the market volatility. Um, but what we're telling clients is the same thing we always tell them that uh, first of all, th th this isn't even that severe. 
uh, of a sell-off, very candidly, we're we're actually doing quite well. We're we're uh, we've been down the last couple of days, but we were barely down at all relative to the the market. And that the entire point of the portfolio that they have is to endure moments like this. Mm. Uh, if it wasn't Japan and yen and and overvalued Nasdaq and Marjorie Taylor Greene and Kamala Harris, <laughs> it would have been something else. This is part of being a risk investor, and that by investing in companies that have the recurring free cash flow that our companies do, we believe they're immunized from the noise of markets. Because your your portfolio tries to go after or generally generally goes after companies that, that have dividends. Is that correct? Yeah, we, we are primarily focused in our U.S. equity um, allocation to company. It's only about 30 companies in the portfolio, very high conviction, more concentrated, and they're companies that are profitable and then are sharing those profits with us as owners of the business and what's called a dividend. Yeah. So I wanted to go back. Um, I think you mentioned this earlier, Gabe, but I wanted to ask you, David, about uh, Warren Buffett is sort of in the news for selling off like 390 million Apple shares over the weekend. Um, is is that Gabriel or Toby? Real quick, he didn't sell them over the weekend. It was re- disclosed over the weekend. They had been selling them over that's, the last quarter. That's helpful. Ninety days. Ah, that's helpful. Well, yeah. there you go. Yeah. Uh, is that is that? I guess that's facing the number two technically. It's basically it? seventy five billion dollars is, over a quarter. You're saying because that's what that's the number I saw was seventy five billion. Yeah, in dollars. That's right. Yeah. Uh, and I guess well, maybe it, it softens my question, but maybe doesn't necessarily take it all the way away. Which is just. Is that um, does that line up with your points uh, that you made earlier about lack of confidence, maybe in AI and Nvidia being overpriced? Yeah. Is is that what you're seeing there, or something else? I do, I do think so. I think it's fair to say that it he could be trimming large gains in positions. He's made a fortune in Apple. And in theory, he could be taking down an oversized position just to redeploy and do a better opportunity. We do that all the time, Mm. where we're trimming gains because we just simply have an opportunity cost by holding it, and we want to redeploy it somewhere else. But I got to say, $75 billion, that size of position, what it means to the tax side of Berkshire... I suspect that, uh, and, and and again, he's in his 90s. There's a team of, of people behind all this. It isn't really a Buffett trade. It's an institutional Berkshire decision. But yeah, I think it does speak to their view that this was way out of whack in terms of uh, valuation. Hey, David, I just wonder, like the, the next four years, depending on, well, oh, let me let me frame it like this. Can we have a absolutely amazing economy in the next four years? And what would it take for us to do that? Can we have an amazing economy in the next four years and an amazing economy being defined by job growth, wage growth, yes. and profit growth? Yes. Um, yes, we can. I, I, I don't know that we will. I think it's very possible we have an okay uh, economy for four years. Um, but I don't, I would be surprised if it were amazing, but for it to be amazing, you would have to have a big boost in productivity as a result of just a renaissance of capital expenditures of new investment of new production, um, industrial investment that was outside the AI story, um, some sort of productivity enhancement. And there is a lot of talk about new factory construction, um, new uh, uh, endeavors to reshore or onshore certain elements of manufacturing. Um, There's a possibility of some of those things marginally helping the economy. Uh, Certainly, if you you were king for a day and there was some uh, stimulative tax change or deregulation, um, I think any form of, of real significant investment in energy independence, uh, taking all the handcuffs off, um, mm. our ability to export liquefied natural gas, uh, to build nuclear, to uh, build refineries, uh, these are things that could be wildly stimulative to the economy and, and authentic, not made up projects, not Keynesian ditch digging, yeah. but more akin to like building the Hoover Dam, good projects that have a productive, sensible economic use. 
But yeah, I don't think the odds are very high of those things happening. But those are the things that could be helpful in the short term for yeah, the economy. That's great. Because the reason I'm asking is because everybody acts like that. We can just vote our way out of this. And I, and I understand that. And so we're thinking if we can just get the right. Like I heard Trump say, Christians, if you just vote for me, you'll never have to vote again. Just this, <laughs> just do it. And right. I think, though, he's nailed something about how we think about politics and how we think about the economy. We get the right guy in there. He fixes all this in four years and everything's amazing. But it seems like we can get there. We can get some things to become amazing, but we have a lot to do. What over the next 15 to 20 years to have a stable economy? Well, yeah, I mean, look, the biggest thing, if you're talking about where the government actually controls it or has some impact on it, is federal spending. Mm. So if somebody wanted to say, vote for me now and then you'll never need to vote again, um, you know, obviously I'm critical of that being a sort of messianic uh, view of uh, politics and the presidency. But um, I don't take it very seriously because it's obviously hyperbolic right. and just kind of the, the way he talks. I don't think he should get a pass for it. I think it's an utterly idiotic thing to say, but I don't. it's hyperbolic. But, but to your broader point, the, the thing that someone would have to do to create structural reform from government is cut the size of government, which means they couldn't get elected. Yeah. Mm. So you can't you can't <laughs> fix the thing that most needs to be fixed without a uh, uh, revival and reform in the people. The people have to want a smaller size of government to get a smaller size of government. You can't get government spending down. You can't get government indebtedness down. And you can't get a debt to GDP ratio that improves unless there is less size government in the overall economy. It's about 24, 25% of GDP now. It had been 16, 17%. If we're going to stay between 20 and 25%, that's downward pressure on growth. We need the federal government to be smaller than it is. I know a lot of people would like it to be 2% or 4% or something again, but just realistically, that's not going to happen. The, but um, I do think we could get government as a percentage of GDP back to 16 to 19%. But who's going to run on that platform and deliver those kind of spending cuts and and the pain that will go with them, the short term pain that will go with them? Um, that, that, that's the problem we have on this on this well, subject. David Bonson for president. <laughs> <laughs> he said he'd never get elected. <laughs> I'm still I'm still over here. Like, so under Eisenhower, Toby, I want you to Google my last name sometime. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I have. I have. Ninety percent was the upper tax bracket of Eisenhower. Eisenhower. Yep. Uh -huh. I'm still over here thinking, yeah, we so we've been doing this. I mean, I know the overall size of government spending to GDP was a lot smaller under Ooh. that. But but we've been we've been doing this for decades. I mean, to, to be stealing that much money from some of the most productive people in our country. It's mm. incredible. All the way back, you know, and many, many conservative Christians, like, you know, only we get back to the 1950s. Yeah. Yeah. But, but Toby, we weren't stealing from those people because those people were too smart to be stolen from. So what we were doing was stealing from our own productivity by giving all the incentives yeah. in the world to those people to not pay 90%. Yeah. yeah. So they would they would game the system. They would set up offshore trusts. They would not work in the second half of the year. Yeah. They it, it facilitated and incentivized a black market. The, all mm. that you did was move money. You rechanneled resources, time, talent and treasure yeah. from the productive to the unproductive. Every dollar I spend in legal fees and accounting fees and regulatory compliance those are all unproductive expenditures that are keeping me from spending money productively. That's the biggest crime of the 90% marginal Goodness. rate, 70% marginal rates, yep. is that it not only represents theft if it were actually paid, sure. but it is incentivizing people to go be non-productive. It's, it's like... It, oh. it's like um, it's sort of like a, it's theft that may, even if the theft is aimed at one particular person, it's like it's, it's invisible hand theft. Well, yeah, it's like it's like shared theft. It's, yeah. it's like theft dispersed, like it's yeah. stealing from the society, you know, but directed at this particular productive individual or somebody who would be productive yeah. if they were if they were left alone. I, I have um, 
I have one other question. I, I don't know how much time we got left, but we got about ten minutes. I, I know. I think we've. I think we've asked you about this before, David. But I don't remember your answer. I wasn't. I wasn't taking good notes. I and I. But it has to do with tariffs. Um, yeah, because oh, that's good, this yeah. is something that keeps coming up with Trump. And I hear some people, you know, and I've sort of grown up in the sense of just like, because I believe in free markets, I don't, I don't want tariffs stay out of my, you know, stay, stay out of our, our business. And at the same time, I know I've heard stories where when you've got China, um, you know, putting a bunch of tariffs on our uh, exports, um, Trump says, well, you know, I go in and I, I threaten them with tariffs and yeah. then, you know, voila, the tariffs are gone. Or, you know, at least we, 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 we come to some kind of understanding. Um, what's your take on this? And again, maybe from a, there's like an ideal sense of, you know, maybe no tariffs at all. And, and, but is it, is there, there's a, also a political, is, is there a tactical use for them? What, what do you, what's your take? Yeah. So, um, Right now, President Trump is the one who has said, I don't want there to be tariffs, but if I threaten, they become a blunt object uh, object for me to have as a negotiating tool. Right. I don't quite understand how it is a helpful negotiating tool if you tell the other side it's only a negotiating tool. <laughs> but nevertheless, um, it is certainly untrue that tariffs are paid by the other country. Tariffs are paid by the users of the product yeah, being right, tariffed. Right. And if we want to be very consistent, we don't need to even use the word tariff. It's called a tax. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So people who are pro-tariffs or pro-tax. Right. Now, you said something very important. There's a fairness argument or equity argument being made. Well, they're putting tariffs on us, so let's put tariffs on them. Yep. But who is they and who is we? The company that chooses to buy products from China... If China puts a tariff on them, that company can say, I'm not going to buy the product from China. Mm -hmm. in, in, in other words, the tariff that is unfair, there's a decision maker involved. The person with skin in the game in the transaction. And obviously, the net cost of importing from China with whatever tariffs they have, which have generally, they're more selective. Mm -hmm. Now, again, what happens here when I make this economic argument is people switch and go, oh, yeah, but China's evil. They're communists. They're <laughs> atheists. Yeah. But that's not what we were talking about. They steal our IP, but that's not what we were talking about. If we're only talking about protectionism, just the economic argument of tariffs, uh -huh. I continue to believe that the people most qualified to make a decision about uh, the buy and sell are the people who are buying and selling. <laughs> that's right. Yes, right, well, I do not need President Trump to tell us if China is taxing us too much. I believe I can make that decision for myself. Mm -hmm. But what the real motive is, is trying to protect uh, one economic actor in America from another economic actor in America. You know, uh, J.D. Vance had a line about um, there is no amount of cheap toasters worth one manufacturing job. In America, I don't know if that's true for the thousand people buying the toasters. <laughs> I mean, at the end of the day, right. this that's a mercantilism that is he's being very honest that what he's saying is I would like a thousand people to pay more for toasters for one manufacturing job or what have you. Um, we do not primarily have a decline of manufacturing labor in America because of trade with China. Um, it's been a factor, but this started years and years and years before WTO, and it is primarily a byproduct of the fact that significant amounts of things can get manufactured in America now with less workers. And we're not a cost-effective country to hire people. The unions add a ton of cost. Our benefits to cost a lot of money. So it is just simply cheaper to do elsewhere. Tariffs um, as an instrument to try to impact trade decisions are distortive. They're inflationary. And they also are coupled with an income tax. So when people say, well, our founding fathers believed in tariffs, but we didn't have a federal income tax until the 16th Amendment. Interesting. So when we were using tariffs, debt to GDP, excuse me, spending to GDP, it was mostly paid for, yeah. was 2% of GDP. Hmm. To generate the $6 trillion a year we spend now in tariffs, you would have to have a 300% tax rate on every product we're importing, hmm. which would mean, of course, zero revenue because no one would pay it. 
Right. <laughs> right. So I got I got a couple questions here. Um, uh, one is the other tariff argument uh, that I don't think has been talked about or addressed yet is the idea that well we um, need tariffs so it keeps American jobs here in America, right? You know, because China can produce widgets cheaper than us, and so if we you know. Um, fine or tax China, you give tariffs, it allows to keep jobs here in America. Um, what's your response to that? Again, that's a protectionist argument that, first of all, that you're, we, it's obviously untrue. It doesn't move the jobs back to Ohio. It moves them to Mexico. It moves them to South Korea. It moves them to other countries, Vietnam. But if we just said we're going to put a very high tariff on all countries, then the the impact to economic growth would be brutal. It would it's Smoot Hawley, nineteen twenty nine. It's a Great Depression. Mm-hmm. You cannot cut off the law of comparative advantage. There are countries that do things cheaper than we do, and we do cheaper than they do, and we trade with one another. That's what built the prosperity. So there's no limiting principle to that thinking. Um, I do believe that individual consumers have every right to say, I just like buying products made in Ohio better, and I want to do that. And people build a brand around Made in America and so forth. They have that right and decision. But what you're doing when you say, we know products at Walmart will be cheaper when we have imports, but we want jobs for the Rust Belt, you're basically saying we want we're site we want the government to put their thumb on the scale for producers versus consumers. Yep. But in a free market, you you have to allow market forces to play those things out. And then that's when the subject gets changed to fairness because of China's tariffs right. or human rights or IP theft. And and no <laughs> no you guys have been through enough theological discussions with people. Nobody confident in their position changes their argument four times in one conversation. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and this happens with this topic all the time. It's exhausting. I very much believe in American workers and in supporting American workers. I do not believe in lying to American workers. Mm. You are not going to get shoes made in Ohio as cheap as they can be made in other countries. But you can build new jobs as we did, 51 million new jobs when we began outsourcing more and more manufacturing with other services, other industries, other components of economic activity. So technology is a factor, but we need a dynamic labor force. We need mobility, but we can't lie to people and make this a nativist argument. That's why Adam Smith wrote The Wealth of Nations. It also seems like you have... At the same time, they're saying we're trying to keep jobs here. We want jobs here. We want to protect jobs here. I mean, all those regulations. I mean, That's we have, what I was we've about. we've yeah. regulated right. ourselves. Right. You know, t- the ability for people to, to offshore. To, yeah, yeah. We, and so like we made and it, tax regulation yeah. and tax. Uh, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Both those things yeah. make it so difficult to start and run small businesses and manufacturing here in the states. And it's like, well, if we really care about these these jobs, then we could first of all take all the chains off. Yeah. Toby, when we when Intel started moving its manufacturing of semiconductors in the late 90s to Taiwan, they were paying 35% of net income in corporate taxes. Wow. That was the factor, yeah. is that oh the tax gosh. burden was so high, they began looking for offshore alternatives. Right. And, and so it, that's one of my biggest frustrations with people favoring industrial policy to get our way out of it, is it lets the government off the hook mm. for the policies they did have that were actually hurting this. <laughs> But the other piece to tariffs, again, to make this full circle, is we say we're going to protect American workers. But, Gabe, we make a lot of things here, too, that we sell to others. Yeah. If we tariff them, they tariff us. Yeah. So then now you're costing workers' mm. jobs in retaliatory tariffs. Okay, oh, this wow. is a tit for tat, and yeah. it doesn't end well. Signed, 1930. So what are you? Facts. This is what are you? I, I, I wish Back people the just uh, love the free market again. I know. I wish they just love the 100%. free market. It's, mm, so, go ahead, David, what do you think of, um, uh, and then we, we got to let you go because I know you got a, a call you got to jump on, but what do you think of the, the CHIPS Act that's trying to bring uh, back semiconductor manufacturing in Ohio? I've all always that hated stuff. that. Anyway. Yeah. Go ahead. It's outrageous. I was uh, vehemently opposed to it. I I made a handful of calls and hosted conference calls with some senators on this subject because I feel so strongly about it. Um, The companies that are receiving from CHIPS Act are largely companies with tens of billions of dollars of net income. 
um, that are then being paid to do what they were going to do anyways mm. and allegedly moving different jobs off uh, back on shore. I'm all for our semiconductor manufacturing having a domestic capability for national security interest. Yeah. Um, I do not believe in corporate welfare to get that to happen. Then they immediately attach to CHIPS Act um, all of these woke requirements that they had to have daycare available and they had to hire certain minorities and they had to have yep. green requirements. It just became the, uh, this utter joke of DEI wokeness. And then after receiving eight and a half billion dollars, Intel fired 15,000 people last week anyways. Wow. Corporate welfare never works. This is cronyism. And it was never going to help American workers. It was a debacle. And the people who supported it should be ashamed of themselves. All right. This hmm. is the, the last and most important question here. Um, our conference is in uh, uh, Texas and Fort Worth in, in October. And the topic's prodigal America. Basically, you know, where does America need to repent? You know, is America going to return to the father? You know, where where do you think our economic sins are at? Where does America need to repent in terms of our economic sins? Our economic sins as a country, um, well, that's, that's a great theological question because they always send, they always come out of a violation of the first commandment, thou shalt have no other gods before me. And when we um, essentially have deified government, um, it is idolatrous. Mm. We have the size of government we have because we have a low responsibility, low self-government culture. Um, and out of the, these low views of church, low views of community, low views of family, you get all kinds of economic um, dysfunction. But I think that uh, on an individual level, when you're talking to people more pastorally, spiritually, it is covetousness. It is class warfare. It's favor. It's the fact that people demonize wealthy so much. That is an overt violation of the 10th commandment that we are totally fine with all the time. Mm. And I should know people really don't like me. <laughs> <laughs> we like you, Dave. Yeah, I do. know you do. I know you do. But yeah, um, Gabe, I would, I would want to think about that a little more. I could give you a better answer next time. Yeah. But I think, I think it is um, living outside of our means. Yeah. And and idolatry; those are the heart of these sinful mm. problems economically. Dude, you preached a whole sermon. You said oh, no. it comes out of the violation of the first, first commandment, man. right Amen. there. Amen. Yeah. Really appreciate you, David. Always, thank you for coming on the show. Yes, and sir. Uh, and and go go get them. Thank you for your friendship, guys. Yeah. Appreciate you. Blessings. Uh, uh, while you're processing that for the next week, man. Uh, if you're single, get married. If you're married, have you some kids. And if you have kids, get your economics right. <laughs> <and baptize. laughs> Until tomorrow, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Go fight, laugh, and feast. This is Cross Politic. You know, that, that makes me want to do a show on the economics of infant baptism. Sure, I could see wow. that. Let's do yeah. that. I could see that.